It's a Friday night Bible study once again and welcome to our family at home. We're going to really praise God this evening and worship Him and give Him the glory that is due His name. Psalm 27, 1. The Lord is my life and my salvation, whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life, of whom shall I be afraid? And Psalm 28, 7 to 8 says, The Lord is the strength and my the Lord is my strength and my shield. My heart trusted in him and I am held. Therefore my heart greatly rejoices. And with my song I will praise him. The Lord is their strength and he is their saving refuge of his anointed. And tonight the song that we're going to lift up, we're going to lift up two songs. One is called Sea of Victory and the other is very well known, I Raise a Hallelujah. And as we see things happening around us on a moment-to-moment -moment basis, our trust has to be only in God. Some trust in chariots and horses, as we know, meaning the arm of the flesh, the world, but we will trust in the name of the Lord our God. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper, church. And this week I've been constantly singing and declaring that all things work together for good. And tonight we're going to see a victory. On Sunday I actually shared that this week, we wanted to hear testimonies. I've heard three amazing testimonies so far. So I want to give God the glory. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. I'm going to see a victory tonight. For the battle belongs to you, Lord. So we want to declare tonight and proclaim we want to sing the Lord's song on this side of the fight. When we're facing the Goliaths, when we haven't crossed over the Red Sea, that's when we sing. That's the sacrifice of praise. When the enemy comes against us, before we have the victory, that's pure praise and pure trust in God. So declare it, that all things work together for good. For those who love God and are called according to his purpose, I'm going to see a victory because the God I serve knows only to triumph. We're going to have an awesome word ministered this evening. Amen. An awesome word from the throne room. And this time that we've had the past how many months has become actually precious because the souls that really desire him are pushing past and pushing through the crowd and really desiring to touch the hem of his garment. My scripture reminds me not to forsake the assembling of yourselves together. And even for you at home, assemble with us in spirit now. There will be one accord in one spirit, that there'll be an open heaven. Sunday's anointing in this house was awesome. And it was amazing. You could feel the tangible presence of Almighty God. And as time gets darker, so much more our light will shine brighter. But we need to take our place. We're going to lift up our voice. We're going to lift up our eyes to when comes our salvation. We're going to see the Goliaths of our lives come tumbling down. Because the weapons of our warfare are not carnal. These are the scriptures that have been deposited in our spirit from time old. And now we're drawing the sword of the spirit and severing the head of Goliath. I read something this week that spoke to me, jumped out of the page. And it speaks about the word of God, about the Bible, about the truth of the word of God. That heaven and earth will pass away, but his word will remain. It is settled in heaven. And it said, theology in the hands of the Holy Spirit is a beautiful science. Theology in the hands of an unbeliever is death. So don't worry about the world trying to say to you that the Bible is fable and myths. Our word is true. Let God be true and every man a liar. Because nothing has changed. Theology in the hands of the Holy Spirit is a beautiful science. You see how the word confirms itself and validates itself. Through thousands of years, these authors wrote separately, didn't even know each other, and yet there's a thread of truth. And that thread of truth is Jesus Christ himself. The way, the truth, and the life. And for us to be here tonight is a privilege and an honor because none of you or I could come unless the Father in heaven had called us. The Father of creation, the author, the beginning. And can you understand that? Have we fathomed such great love, such unsearchable knowledge? 
and he calls us for a time such as this. I don't want to die in the pastures when there's so much of a, a harvest, fields white for harvest. Don't allow yourself to just lie down in green pastures. It's not time to lie down, it's time to stand up, church. So let's stand together. The weapon may be formed, but it won't prosper. When the darkness falls, it won't prevail. Because the God I serve knows only how to triumph. And my God will never fail. Praise God.
unite our hearts now as we raise a hallelujah. Let's prepare our hearts for the word to go out in power. That there'll be an open heaven tonight. That the anointing that breaks the yoke is present once again. Oh, once again we raise a hallelujah. And our weapon is our melody, God. And we know that heaven fights for us as we stand our ground. Hallelujah. May you be glorified tonight in the midst of your people. In the assembly of believers, may your name be lifted up on high. As we unite with the angelic beings tonight and sing a hallelujah. Hallelujah.
Well, it's good to be here once again. If you can take your seats, I'm going to invite Deacon Andrew to come up and take the next part of our service. Good evening, church. How are we all doing? All good? Good. Praise God. Uh, just a quick announcement before we come to our time of uh, offering. Um, as you heard last week, Archbishop is holding a seminar, a motivational seminar on success, which is going to be on the Saturday 15th and the 22nd of August. It's going to be held from 1pm to 4pm and it's going to be held here. Um, the details, if you do want to attend, is basically you just got to email us at info at Edmonton Eagles ABC. Dot com. So if you would like to come, just register attendance through that email. Also for the, uh, the youth, for 16 to 21, they can attend for free. But all us uh, oldies, uh, there's, a, there's going to be a small, uh, small fee. I actually attended it, I think it was about two years ago now. And, um, you know, it gives you the ingredients that you really need to become successful. The world has got a warped sense of what success is all about, and usually it's just all about money. That's right. But what's the point of having money if you haven't got peace, if you haven't got joy? Amen. So the topics will include having a positive mindset and outlook, which is obviously very important for success, because you know you're gonna get a lot of people that are gonna knock you down, and even yourself, you might feel a little bit demotivated on some days. So the Archbishop will be talking about that, as well as goal setting, and just motivating you in general just to uh, fulfill whatever you want to fulfill is your uh, whether it's a goal for example you might have a work goal you might have a fitness goal it could be anything so I would encourage you to come and just another reminder it's info at edmontoneaglesabc.com for those of you that are watching at home as well um, send your email through to that that you that you would like to attend um, yeah, and that's it. We're going to take our time of uh, offering. So God bless you as you give.
Father, we just want to thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you that we can gather together at a time such as this to hear your word, Lord. We thank you for your love. We thank you for the word that's about to go out in power, Lord. That you just use the Archbishop in a mighty way as you have been week in and week, week out, Lord. And we just want to give you the thanks and the glory, Lord. We thank you for everyone here and everyone who's watching through live and streaming that. We just really open up our hearts to your love tonight, Lord. We just want to give you the praise and the glory. We just thank you for your offering, Lord, that you would use it to extend your kingdom. And I thank you, Lord, that we are a church that reaches out to the community, that we reach out to the lost and the brokenhearted. And we just want to give you the praise, Lord. In your wonderful name we pray, Jesus. Amen. As I invite the Archbishop to come and share the word of the show. It's good to be here. Let's give the Lord another clap off for him. God bless. On this wonderful Friday evening, it's been a hot day. It's been a pleasant, bright day. Let's pray for a bright day in our hearts this evening as God will minister into our lives and bless us. And I want to welcome people watching live stream at home. You are blessed and you are welcome. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's give the Lord another clap off for him. Thank God we're here. Amen. The key to success is... Um, his attitude, and most importantly, have a spiritual disposition, really, because success is not just about material things. I was looking at a documentary where they're trying to find the Ark of the Covenant, and they're also looking at uh, Solomon with all his Solomon's minds and things like this. But at the conclusion of Solomon's life, he had he was one of the most wealthiest men to have ever lived. He said it was all vanity, vanity of vanities. It's like streams flowing to a sea. It can never be full, it can never be satisfied. And it's about, success is about finding your center, your spiritual stability. And that's what's important, praise God, in the midst of the confusion of the world that we are living in. We're going to have God centered into our lives. It changes everything. True success is acknowledging and connecting with your divine identity. And this is what the message is tonight about. It's the nature of God. You know, through history, uh, the nature of God has been debated by many people. There have been a sense of much debate, especially from a theological point of view or perspective. And this is what we're going to just explore this evening. How do we connect with divine identity? Because connecting with divine identity is the key to knowing who we are, who we should be, I should say. The reason people are lost, don't have no direction in life, is because they don't know the source they come from. They don't know where they've come from, therefore they don't know where they're going. And we need to really just reflect upon this, this subject, which is a very deep subject. It's very deep, very complicated, but simple at the same time. If we just humble ourselves before God and ask Him to reveal His purpose into our life. So tonight's message is the nature of God. In fact, the Apostle Paul, when he was debating himself about the nature of God with the people in Greece, the, Thessal the Athenians, the philosophers at that time on Mars Hill, he made an interesting statement. I want to just use this as the basis foundation for tonight's Bible study. And as I always say, Friday is a Bible study. I make no apologies for going to the depth, width, length and height of the Word of God because it's here to edify us, to help us on our spiritual journey. Praise God. Nothing that you do for God will go to waste. Whether you watch this on live stream or you come here physically, nothing will go to God will bless you because you have taken the time to receive his word in due season. Praise the Lord. So let's just come to the passage of scripture. I want to lay as a foundation for tonight's message. It's Acts chapter 17. If you read the whole chapter in its entirety when you have your time. But I want to read it as a, as a foundation. A few verses. I've taken verse 28 and verse 29 out to lay this down to look through this lens to see what it's all really, what it's all about. This is what Paul tells the Athenian philosophers. For in him we live and move and have our being, as certain also of your own poets have said, for we are also his offspring. Verse 29. For as much then as we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that the Godhead is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's devices. It's interesting that he says that 
your poets say that you are the offspring of God. This is for the Thessalonian audience, the Stoics there, the, the Platonists, the Aristotelians there, all the different philosophies were gathering together, debating their views and ideas and philosophies, how they thought the world, the world was existing and functioning. And he says, well, even your own poets say that you, we, you believe that you are the offspring of God. Interesting, that's an interesting statement he's making. Then he goes on to say, for as much then as we are the offspring of God, he says, well, if we are the offspring of God, we ought not to think that God, the Godhead, is like unto gold or silver or stone, graven by art and man's devices. So all these material things that we're seeing around us, that means they're not an end. They have no life in them. The only life you give them in power is the value you place on them. The value you place on them, the price you place on them, that's what gives them value and purpose, if you like, praise God. And they use for a secondary purpose, to use for a means to get us somewhere else. But they're not the end in themselves. And he's saying, you're the offspring of God. And interestingly, as I often say, you identify with your parent in some ways. With the nature of your parent, you identify with the nature of your parent. And I often say, a cat has a kitten, a dog has a puppy. It's the same nature. So if we're the offspring of God, there must be something to define that nature. That divinity must permeate us. We must, that must be part of our divinity, must be part of our makeup. But because we've been lost, we walk around in darkness and we don't see the truth because we're caught up in ourselves. Because self equals darkness. Christ equals light. God equals light. Self, you cut off that light. When you're egotistic and you're only looking to yourself, you really cannot see reality. Job made this statement when they're trying to console him and challenge him about his condition, his suffering. He made an interesting statement because the world and the philosophers were searching for God, but they couldn't actually get arrive at that particular destination to know God. And Job made the statement in Job chapter 23, verse 8. He says this, look, I go forward, but he's not there. And backward, but I cannot perceive him. When he works on the left hand, I cannot behold him. And when he turns to the right hand, I cannot see him. He said, every, every means, every effort I exert to connect with God, is, is, is point, is, it, ends to nothing, it ends with nothing. And because we're at the mercy of God. God himself is the only one who sometimes allows us to have a little glimpse or grasp of his presence in our life. And the, and, and, and the, and the, 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 the environment has to be right. Our attitude has to be right to glimpse, to actually see him operating and working, not just in our lives, but in the world. I wish, you know, sometimes I, I come to the world, I wish people, you know, when I used to teach music, because I was a diploma, I was a performance level in classical guitar, I used to get frustrated sometimes with, with the beginners playing their, their guitar, the little one, two, one, two. When you're working all around the instrument, you close your, you know exactly where every note is, every chord is, and you know all the different aspects of the guitar. Then when you get to the, the, the beginner stage, the, the elementary stage, you, you have to sometimes, you're, you're, you're trying to teach them, but it's frustrating because you want to run ahead, but you can't because you have to slow down to make sure they're keeping up with you. And this translation has translated into my ministry sometimes because I know there's a depth, width, and height of God. I've been to the mountain. I've been through the veil. I've seen things that, you know, even theologians, carnal theologians, cannot grasp and understand. And I want people to keep up with me. Sometimes I, sometimes I have to slow down. You know, sometimes you, when, you, when people say, I want to, I want to train, I want, when we train for the marathon, you want to do a run with people, and you start running this. Initially, they're younger people, some in themselves, they feel younger, they sprint on ahead, next thing you know they're dying on the sidewalk because they, they burn themselves out. And sometimes and you want to run with people who can keep up with you and keep the pace with you to get to that destination. And that relates to the Word of God. There's depth to the Word of God. If you understand what this actually means, it's powerful, it is profound. Oh, praise God. So he's saying, he said, look, God reveals himself on a level and in a place that according to the ability we have to receive him. He works on a level that's beyond our ability to grasp unless he allows us to come into that revelation of his word, of himself and of his presence. Praise God. Amen. Amen. So, so the thing is, in the, the climate, the, the, the place has to be right to see God. Jesus himself made this statement. You know, it's interesting. We're going to come to this. 
We're going to come to this. But it's interesting. Jesus made a statement when he was expounding on the Beatitudes and on the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter 5, verse 8. This is what the Lord said. And this is powerful, profound. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And the thing is, we look, we're looking around, but it's the attitude of the heart that actually defines what we actually see and gives us clarity, gives clarity of sight. In fact, in the Gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 7, this is what the Lord, this is the dialogue taking place. After he reveals that he's the way, the truth, and the life, he says, if you had known me, you would have known my Father also. And from now on, you know him and have seen him. Watch this, watch. Verse 8 says this. Philip said to him, now this is the Philip we find in chapter 1. Who calls Jesus the son of Joseph. Okay, he calls him the son of Joseph. Whereas Nathanael says, you are the king of Israel. You are the son of God. Seeing the same person, but different interpretations as to who Jesus is. We come to church, we see, we listen to the messages. We live with different perceptions of what that message is. Because we define that message or we interpret that message according to our preconceptions and our limitations. If we carnally mindset, we have a carnal mindset. We don't see the width and, and depth and height of the word of God and look at it through God's eyes. Apart, but we look at it through our eyes. And God wants us to look at his word through the filter of Jesus Christ. Okay, okay, watch this. He says, he, he says, Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father. Can we go back, please? And it is sufficient for us. That Jesus is with them, ministering, they're around him, having a dialogue with him. He just says, I'm the way, the truth, and the life. He says, no one comes to the Father except for me. And they said, well, show us the Father. Watch this, what was Jesus says? Because we're talking about the offspring of God now. And Jesus is the offspring of God. He's the Word of God. He's the Son of God, but also the Son of Man. He connects with humanity and divinity. But watch this. Watch what happens in the next verse. He says this. Jesus said to him, Have I been with you so long, and yet you have not known me, Philip? He who has seen me has seen the Father. So how can you say, show us the Father? Everything that pertains to the Father is translated, is embodied in me. Praise God. So, so he says, blessed are the pure enough for they shall see God. It's our disposition that, that defines, as sh- really shows where we are in, in how we seek Jesus was God incarnate. He had all the tributes of the Father, tributes of the Father, but they couldn't see it because the problem was not with Jesus' identity. The problem was, was with Philip's perception. So when people don't see you in the light how God, what God is making you to be, the problem is not on your side. The problem's on the side of the ones who are short-sighted, who have blurred vision, who don't have the 2020 vision. And they try to draw you to their limitation. Why? Because they refuse to get up and come to meet you where you are. They want you to come where they are. Yeah? He says, show us that. And then he says this, verse 10. Watch this. He says, do you not believe that I am in I am in the Father and the Father in me? The words that I speak to you, I do not speak on my own authority. But the Father who dwells in me does the work. Dwells in me does the work. So what was saying, offspring of God, that, that Paul's challenging the, the Athenian community philosophers and the people, the audience there, about identity. And said, well, if you're saying you are the sons of God, then, then why, why you, if, God, if gold is a God, why aren't you gold? If wood is the God, why ain't you wood? But you're flesh and blood. But there's something more to that flesh and blood. There's the breath of God in you that connects you to divinity. Oh, praise God. And that's what it's about here. And that's why Jesus says, Blessed are the pure in heart, for they should see God. Philip had a problem. He had, he had a, a blockage in his heart. He couldn't look through the eyes of faith to see that Jesus was God incarnate. So he always limited Jesus, he calls him son of Joseph. He puts the car- car- carnality on spirituality. For example, the Philistines put mud, earth, in the wells of Abraham. Yeah, They put mud, earth, in the wells. Because when you haven't transcended your human limitation, you'll always interpret things carna- carnally and not spiritually. Yeah? And so... So we're told that uh, Job's trying to find God, but he can't. When he goes to the right, he's at the left. When he goes to the left, he cannot. In himself, he doesn't have the ability to grasp hold of the divine nature, what God is where, in his pure, pure form, if you like. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. 
Okay? And this is why Jesus talking to the people around him tells them that God, the presence of God is not detected by observation, physical observation. Because if you can see God by your physical, natural eyes, just by them, then there's no need to see them through the eyes of your heart. Right. See them through the eyes of your heart. There's no need for purity in heart. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. And if, if anyone can see God, just any which way, then you don't need to do any catharsis, you don't need to do any cleansing, you don't need to do any fasting, you don't need to have any sacrifices, because everyone's going to see God. God is around, I'm telling you, God is more alive today than ever before. He's in ACC, he's in this building, he's around you, he's walking the streets of Edmonton, he's all around the whole world, praise God. Forget about viruses, God transcends viruses, he is here with us. It's the pure in heart that know that his presence is here, praise God. Hallelujah. And this is why the Lord's talking to the people, the Pharisees who challenge him in Luke chapter 17 verse 20. Now when he when he was asked by the Pharisees when the kingdom of God will come, he answered them and said, the kingdom of God does not come with observation. They will not say, see here or see there. This is what Job was, look here, look there, let me see the kingdom of God. Why? Because the kingdom of God, indeed, the kingdom of God is within you. It's a feeling, it's an experience. And often when, years ago when I was teaching in the school, I used to ask the children in the, in the RE lessons, the religious education lessons or religious studies lesson, when we used to talk about God's presence around the world and does he exist, how does he look? And we have all different answers. And then I say to them, well, you know, can we see God? I said, well, you may not see him always with your physical eyes, but sometimes you can feel him deep within. They say, how does that, how does it, how does that work? I said, so I give them a paper, I say, okay, can you do something? Draw the wind. So we can't see the wind. But does the wind exist? Because you cannot see the wind, does that mean because you cannot see it? It means it doesn't exist, it, is, it negates its existence. So no, it exists. How do you know it exists? Because we feel it. Amen. And it says the same way you feel the wind, there are people who feel the presence of God. The Shekinah presence and glory. There's some people who can feel the, in their hearts. They can feel it within themselves. But you, know, you do not see the wind, but you can see what the wind causes. You can see the clothes blowing on the clothesline. You can see the weeds floating around in the air. You, that's not the wind. That's the tribute. That's the cause of the wind. And sometimes people kneel down. That is the, the feeling of God. Some people rise up. That's the feeling of God. Some people go out and serve the purpose of God. Go to the homeless. Go to the sick. But some people do things, extraordinary things, because that's the feeling of God drives them. Oh, hallelujah. You don't need to see God with your physical eyes to have a godly experience and a godly encounter, praise God. Hallelujah. He is around us. But sometimes many people do not know that he's here. Let me tell you, he's here. When two or three are gathered in the midst together, in his name, he's, in the, he's here. He's in your living room where you are now. He's around. Just open those spiritual eyes and see his glory. See his presence. And get have that life-changing experience with the master himself. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise God. Jacob, when he had the dream, sometimes before God wakes you up, he has to put you in a dream. Before he woke Adam up, he put him in a sleep. Before Jesus rose from the dead, he was put in a sleep. Sometimes God puts you in a sleep before he wakes you up. To get your attention. I wish I was speaking to someone. You see when Jacob was fleeing from his brother Esau. Afraid. God has not given us a spirit of fear. But a power of love and of a sound mind. He was afraid. It was night. The sun set on him. Praise. But sometimes the sun has to set. Because, before it can truly rise. Yeah. Hallelujah. And he had a dream. And he saw a ladder. From heaven to earth. From earth to heaven. Angels ascending and descending and ascending. On this ladder, praise God. Hallelujah. And he concludes after the dream. He said this in Genesis 28 verse 16. Then Jacob awoke from his sleep and said, When you wake up from your sleep, you're going to know that God is in the house. Amen. Some walk sleepwalking. We have a lot of great sleepwalkers coming to church. They come in asleep and they leave asleep. Try not to shout loud, you might wake them. They're sleepwalkers, praise God. Bumping into each other. <laughs> Hallelujah. And he says when he woke, awoke from his sleep, it's time to wake up, ACC. It's time to wake up if the church council. It's time to wake up people at home. It's time to wake up and know that God is in the house. 
is surely the Lord is in this place. And I did not know it. Because when you're asleep, you may not know the Lord is in this place. But let me tell you, the Lord is in this place. Hallelujah. Praise God. And God works on different levels, praise God. But so often we do not have the capacity to decipher, to understand the way God works. Hallelujah. Because he works, says, without his consent, he's unreachable. Paul, writing to Timothy, the word Timothy means honour of God. In 1 Timothy chapter 6, verse 15, said this. Which he will manifest in his own time. He who is the blessed and only potentate, the King of kings and Lord of lords. Watch this. Verse 16. Who alone has immortality, dwelling in an approachable light, whom no man has seen or can see, to whom be honour and everlasting power. Amen. This is interesting. Just this thing. He says, flesh and blood does not inherit the kingdom of God. The carnal man cannot see this divine vision. You need the key to understand the call, what Paul is saying. And oftentimes people try and see God, and they, they do this research, they do all these type of things from a car. I heard Penny say something earlier on. The spirit of what did you say about the spirit of God and the, the word of God and the spirit of God interpreting? Theology in the hands of the Holy Spirit is, is beautiful, a beautiful science. Theology in the hands of an atheist, is the atheist, is dead. And you can research from now to kingdom come, as they say, unless you have the Spirit as your, as your helper, as your comforter, you will not learn anything. What is of the flesh is flesh, and what is of the Spirit is spirit. Jesus Christ is the filter to see God. It says in the Old Testament it was prohibited for anyone to look upon God, to see the face of God. They saw the tributes of God, but they couldn't see, have a full-blown vision of God. Watch this. But they often said, we saw God and our life was preserved. But I want to take you somewhere because this is connected to the nature of God. And we're coming somewhere here in relation to the nature of God. You see in John chapter 1 verse 18, it says no one has seen God at any time. No one has seen God at any time. But it goes on to say, praise God, that we have hope through the Son. Because it's by virtue of the Son that we have a, a connection with divinity. He's the filter. He's the safety net that we can approach God without being harmed. Oh. He says, the only begotten Son who is in the bosom of the Father, he has declared him. It's not seeing God, but he has, in fact, the Greek actually doesn't say declare. It doesn't actually say declare. It says something else. Let me just read the Greek, please, very quickly. It's not, the Greek word is not to declare, it's to explain him. So he's the filter. He gives us clarity as to what divinity is about because he's the offspring of God, of the Father. So he's divine. And so to connect with Jesus Christ, we're connecting to the Father. The Father's nature, in a sense, which, which unites the, the Godhead. Oh, praise the Lord. So what is the remedy to see his pure essence, to have a connection with the pure essence? Is purity of heart and is to look at God through the eyes through the filter of Christ. Yeah, amen. Because it's powerful, profound. When you get to that place, things become transformed. They want to come to that if time allows this evening. Because Moses wanted to see that pure, uh, natural essence of God, which Paul speaks about to Timothy. He wanted to grasp and have a vision of. Of, of the pure God. The, 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 as, as Paul says, he says there, uh, the, the immun to, alone has immortality, dwelling in approachable life, and whom and no man has seen nor can see, to whom be honour and everlasting power. Amen. He wanted to have a vision of that. The immortal presence of the Shekinah presence of God, the light, the glory of God. And so Moses wanted to have that vision. But the Old Testament doesn't have the capacity, capabilities to reveal that. It's only through Jesus Christ we can have this revelation. 
And it's only through Christ the veil can take, be taken away. And we see the, the, what God is really all about for us, praise God. This is in Exodus chapter 33, verse 18. Watch this. And I want to I highlight a few things here for us. A few images here and put it in the context. And he said, please show me your glory. Then he said, I will make, I will make all my goodness pass before you. And I will proclaim the name of the Lord before you. I will be gracious to whom I will be gracious, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man should see me and live. And the Lord said, here is a place by me, and you should stand on the rock. So it should be, while my glory passes by, that I will put you in the cleft of the rock, and will cover you with my hand while you... I pass by, watch this, watch this. Then I, I will take away my hand and you shall see my back, but my face you should, or should not be seen. Watch this. He says, I will take you, I will put you on the rock. Okay, watch this. He says, I'll put you on, uh, uh, he says, I'll put you on the rock, stand for you to stand on the rock. The rock is a metaphor, an image of Jesus Christ. He's the rock of our salvation, as the psalmist proclaim and declare. But what does he go further? He says, you not only stand on the rock, but you'll come into the cliff of the rock. You'll be hidden in Christ when I pass by. And Christ, and Christ is the shelter, the, the filter, and the safety, the, the, the shield that protects us from the, the presence, awesome Shekinah presence of God. Hallelujah. And the hand of God is Jesus Christ himself. Because he's above us, he's beneath us, he's around us. We're enveloped by him. That's why Paul says, do not make any provision for the flesh. Put on Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh. Because that's the way you see the glory of God. And the glory of God is the face of God. Hallelujah. No man should see him. Watch this, watch this. He says, he says this. So it should be, come to pass that I will put my hand. He says, let me just go, for, just go, verse 20. But he said, you cannot see my face, for no man should see me and live. If I go to verse 20, verse 20, can I have the Hebrew, please? He says, he says, the Hebrew word that's used for man here is not ish which is generated for humanity, is Ha-Adam, the man. Ha-Adam means the carnal man, cannot see his face and live. That's why we have to die in Christ. You cannot see the glory of God in the, in the old man. It's only through the eyes of the new man you can see the presence. I wish I, you know, research this yourself. And I pray you, this is why... If you're a teacher, a Bible teacher, you've got to go to the original languages. You've got to pray. Even the original languages will not help you unless you have a relationship with the Spirit of God Himself. Otherwise, it's all head it will confuse you. The Word of God will confuse you. But if the Word of God becomes clear, no man, no Adam, Adam, relating to the God, the old man. There's the new Adam and there's the old Adam. The old Adam cannot see. the glory. Flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom, kingdom of God. Okay? Praise the Lord. Do you want some more? Yes. Okay. Praise the Lord. So as, as Colossians tells us in chapter 3 verse 3. For you died. Adam died. The old man. Everything old is past. And he goes, and your life, this is Colossians 3 3. And your life is hidden. Where did he put Moses? In the cleft of the rock. It's hidden. With Christ. In God. So Moses desired to see the we desire to see, but we, we give lip service. That's why Jesus said, You honor me with your lips, but your heart is far from me. Why? Because your actions show what you want, not your words. Absolutely. I hate people, we're gonna serve God till the end of time, and next thing you know, they're running all over the place. It's not it's about it's about being focused, being obedient. Obedience is better than sacrifice. Rebellion is like witchcraft. These latter times, Jesus said about the latter times, this little flock. Yes. He didn't say multitude. He said the little flock. Because few and far between now really faithful people. Perhaps I'm looking at the few in this room. God may be doing a sifting. Let's get right. Let's get ready. Praise God. For God. Praise God. So, God, so Moses decided to see the glory of God. And the glory of God was re representing his nature. Oh, hallelujah. 
See, Moses himself, he wrote, God dictated the, 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 the Torah to him. was dictated to Moses on Mount Sinai. And he told him about the beginnings. He told him how a creation came to be. Amen. So he knew something about divine nature because he realised, he knew, because he was writing about the image we were made in. He said in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26, and God said, let us make man according to our image and according to our likeness. So he knew something about that. So he wanted to see the purity, what, he, what God's intention was for us because it was marred, it was damaged through Adam's rebellion. Come on. So the polarity in, in Genesis chapter verse 26 speaks, uh, the polarity is qualified in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1. So he says, let us make man. What, who's the us in this context, in this passage? But we begin in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1, beginning with the us in the beginning. And the us is found embodied in a Hebrew word called Elohim. Oh. Just as in the beginning, Elohim created the heavens and the earth. The word Elohim is a collective noun. I said it last week. We speak about collective nouns. A collective noun is a singular word with a plural meaning. The, we say choir is a singular word, but it has many members. We say team, T-E-A-M, is a, a, a singular word. If we say teams with an S at the end, it means it's plural. But a team on itself is a collective noun, means many parts. And the word Elohim is, is, has a plural meaning. But there's one God, but with a plural meaning. One God, one nature, but distinction in the personalities in the Godhead. Now what we need to discover is how many, how many members are included in that plurality. Amen. But the Word of God explains itself through the Spirit of God. Because in the first three verses, which is appropriate, it reveals the identity of what the Godhead is made up of. So in Genesis chapter 1 verse 1 it says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. That's verse 1. So we have the Godhead. We have God. And the, 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 the Father of creation is the Father. Then we have the next person of that Godhead revealed in verse 2. It says in verse 2 it says, And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the water. So we have the second person in that lineup of the Godhead. So it's lacking what we need the next, what the other members of that body, who they are and how it's represented there. So if we go to verse 3, it says this. And God said, and God said, the power of the word. And we see in John chapter 1 verse 1, in the beginning was the word. We see Jesus Christ represented in the next verse 3. Ironically, if you go to verse 3 in the gospel, in the gospel of John chapter 1 verse 3, it says this. Watch this. All things... What? All things were made through him because there's a continual repetition in Genesis chapter 1 and God said, and God said, and God said the power of the word. All things were made through him and without him nothing was made that was made. We have Father, Son, and Holy Spirit in the first three verses. And that's for ones who are having a divine counsel with each other. What should we do next? Well, let us make man. In our image, reflecting us and our, and our likeness. The image of God is not just made of gold, it's attributes, it's character. Oh. Oh. It's the nature that we connect with divinity. And later on, Isaiah, in Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1, we see the number is represented, represents three here. We see Isaiah chapter 42, verse 1. This is God speaking in this passage. Behold, my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the Gentiles. Now, this is the Father speaking about the Son and, and looking forward, proclaiming, declaring again in the future that he'll put his spirit upon him. Oh, I wish I'm speaking to someone. And this was fulfilled. In Luke chapter 3 verse 22 it says, And the Holy Spirit descended in bodily form like a dove upon him. And it says, And a voice came from heaven which said, You are my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Amen. Hallelujah. What does Isaiah say? Behold my servant whom I uphold, my elect one in whom my soul delights, who I am pleased with. Yeah. And here we have three. We have three at the Jordan. We have the Father's voice. 
We have the Holy Spirit descending as a dove. And we have the, the, the Word, the Son of God. Three represented there. It doesn't stop there. In Isaiah chapter uh, 48 verse 16, watch what it says here. Now, it's the Son speaking. And we see this interaction between the Father, Son and the Holy Spirit. Watch this. Watch this. It says this, 48 verse 16 says this. Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From, from the time that it was, I was there. John 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. In the beginning, I was there. Watch this, watch this. In the, from the beginning, from the time that it was, I was there. And now the Lord God, the Father, and His Spirit have sent me. Oh, you know, we were looking at Isaiah last week. We saw Isaiah chapter 6, when it says, uh, Isaiah sees the Lord lifted on high. When uh, we read on, when Isaiah's lips are touched, in verse Isaiah chapter 6, let's go to verse 6. Then one of the seraphim flew to me, having in his hand a live coal, which he had taken from, with the tongs from the altar. Verse 7. And he touched my mouth with it and said, Behold, this has touched your lips, your iniquity is taken away, and your sin is purged. Verse 8. Also I heard the voice of the Lord saying, Whom shall I send? And who will go for us? Then I said, Here I am, send me. And we see in Isaiah, as we just quoted Isaiah chapter 48, says, Come near to me, hear this. I have not spoken in secret from the beginning. From the time that it was, I was there. And the Lord God and his spirit have sent me. He says, Who shall I send? Who, who shall I send? And who will go for us? Plural. And then he says, and he, and, and, and he says, he says, and so I, I heard the voice of the Lord saying, whom shall I send and who will go for us? Then I said, here I am, send me. This is not Isaiah being sent. This is the word of God. This is Jesus Christ being sent. Because the divine counsel is between the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And they're discussing the Father with the Spirit, sending the Son, the word into the world. Watch this. This is Jesus Christ. And I qualify this before we move on, just in case people say, I'm, I'm, I'm reading things into this that are not there. Verse 9 says this. Watch this. And he said, go and tell these people. Keep on hearing, but do not understand. Keep on seeing, but do not perceive. Who quoted those words? Was it not Jesus Christ when he went to the Pharisees, the Sadducees, the Levites, the people of his day? And this was the word that he declared to them. He says, and he goes in verse 10, says this, watch this. And Jesus said this, make the heart of this people dull and their ears heavy and shut their eyes. He says, I've come to give sight to the blind, but I've come to, give, to make blind those who see. Lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their hearts and return and be healed. This is Jesus Christ. Praise the Lord. So we have the we have the we have the, the the person of the father speaking, then the person of, of, of the son, and then we have the presence of the so we have this tripartite witness from Genesis right through to the book of Revelation. That's why we, we, we limit it, we put a cut on three. Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Jesus said, Go and teach, go and make disciples of all nations, teach them to observe everything I have taught, to observe to, to live by it. And baptizing them in the name of the name is a singular, not the names, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Oh, hallelujah. Psalm 33, verse 6 says this By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made, Jesus, and all the hosts of them by the breath of the Ruah, it says, of his mouth. Oh, hallelujah. Praise God. So we see this qualify the word of God explains and qualifies itself. So we're looking at the nature of God. Oh, hallelujah. We want to connect to that nature because connected to the nature, something happens when you connect to the nature. I want to see, let us see now uh, what is implied by being in the, in the image and likeness of God. That's God's intention. In, in fact, in the New Testament, this is, the, this is where everything, the climax that humanity is going towards, the, the regenerating, not the unregenerated, the ones who accept him, this is the di direction they are going. In the first epistle of, of John chapter 3, verse 2, it says this, Behold, now we are children of God, 
This is verse Behold, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we should be. But we know that when he is revealed, we should be like him. For we should see him as he is, and seeing him as he is, we see ourselves as we should be. Okay? We'll be like him. The Greek says here, or me, the Greek word or me means to be in his likeness. And it's the same Greek words that the Greek translators translated for the likeness in Genesis chapter 1 verse 26. So that's, that's the image we're creating. That's what God had planned, to be a reflection of Christ, the word of God, into the world. Oh, praise God. That's the likeness. But in 2 Corinthians chapter 3 verse 18, watch what it says here, Paul says here. It's interesting because Paul, before the Damascus Road's encounter, he could not understand what he was teaching. And it happens to many people. Amen. He says this, 2 Corinthians 3, 8, he says, But we all, with unveiled faces, beholding us in a mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed into the same image. God said, let us make man according to our image. So those who question Christ, that he is God or not, what he, God's not going to make us in an image of an angel. Okay? Uh, the glory of, uh, being as in the mirror, the glory of the Lord are being transformed in the same image from glory to glory, just as by the Spirit of the Lord. So the word here, image, is Egonan, icon, Egonan in, in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1, the, the translators use the same word here that Paul is uses in here, Egonan, to represent the image, praise God. So we're going to be in the image and likeness. So who's, what is the image and likeness? A reflection of Jesus Christ. That's why Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 1, he says this. It's about the image. He says, imitate me. If you, if you see, see the, the, when they translate all these things, sometimes things get lost in translation. If you put the old King James, okay, it, 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 the translation makes, gives it a completely different connotation. This is more closer, but the, the original King James, the, the King James authorized version, says this. Be ye followers of me, even as I also am of Christ. The Greek word does not say be a follower. Agolothidemi. It doesn't say agolothidemi. It says, mimite, imitate me. Behave like me. Behave like I behave like I behave like Jesus. So the intention of God from the beginning is for us to be a reflection of what Christ in his glory represents. That's the image and likeness of God. Hallelujah. So God's intention from the beginning was to be in his image and his likeness. Now, what are the benefits of being in the image and likeness of God? What is it important to embrace that, to be in, 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 the, in, the, in, the, in the image and likeness of God? Well, firstly, being in the image and likeness of God, you never die. Immortality is part of the nature. It comes with the package. You become immortal. Oh, I wish I would. You, things change. You're empowered. Eternity, immortality. You never die. Yeah? That's what, that's what being in the image and likeness. Because he created us to be in his image and likeness. He was intention was immortality. And that was all at arm's reach from the tree of life. The tree of life was a presence of connecting with Christ back in the day with bypassing the crucifixion. But it was all foreseen. That's why it was, it was slain from the foundation of the world. But there was a remedy before the problem. But part of divine nature is immortality. Never die. That's part of immortality. That part of being in the nature of God. Part of the nature of God. Our nature is connected to his nature, the regenerated nature. That's why Psalm 82 verse 6 says this. I said you are gods, and you are all children of the Most High. But you should die like men, and fall like one of the princes. He says, I said you are gods. You have divinity. To be like God, to be gods, means you have to have immortality. God is immortal. That's what Paul tells us. He's everlasting. That's what the word of God declares. The prophets declare for each one of us, praise the Lord. Hallelujah. 
And that's why Jesus says in John chapter 8 verse 51, Most assuredly I say to you, if anyone keeps my word, he shall never see death. He shall never see death. Because when God created us, he built in us a, a mechanism to be able to, to receive eternity and immortality. Oh. That's why Solomon writing in his wisdom at the time, Ecclesiastes chapter 3 verse 11, he has made everything beautiful in its time. Because in the beginning God made everything good. Also he has put eternity in their hearts. He puts eternity in our hearts. That's why we have a difficulty struggle to come to terms with, terms with death. Because death was not part of our makeup. Death is an enemy. That's why Paul says, that's why Paul calls it the enemy. Death and Hades. He says, where is your sting? Well, we have the victory through Christ Jesus. So we abide. He says, he says if, if anyone keeps my word, he should never see death. Keeping his, what does it mean? Following him, living according to his principles, precepts, statutes, and word. Hallelujah. So that's one thing that you have with that, with, with, uh, with uh, we may sleep, but passing on, like a child born, is born from the mother to the next realm, we're passing through this life, but we'll be eternally existing, living. The next benefit of connecting, waking up to our divine identity, is we have creative power. The reason people do not, and, and I'm convinced by this, I know this, this is a science and not just a, a, a speculative, it's a science. I see people never succeeding in their life. And when I speak with them for a while, I know why they're not succeeding. They block their own passage by their way they speak. By their mindsets. Whereas they should be eagles, they're chickens. The way they talk, the way they behave. The carnal, emotional. They haven't stepped out of that straight jacket of the emotion and speak with rationale, with the power of God, with faith, with belief. That changes everything. Come on. I live my life negative, being, being the prison of other people's limitations over my life. So when I came to the Lord, God removed those limitations. What I can do, everyone can do. God's blessed me in more ways than you can ever imagine. What I do, anyone, but what it takes for it to happen is the attitude and belief system and how you confess. That changes it. That's why I put out the success is not an accident for not just for the church, but for all the community. Because I do believe if you embrace that and live by that, it changes everything. But you've got to change your outlook, your mind will change everything. So I know when I see friends, people I've been acquainted with for 30 years ago, I see they're stuck in the same Groundhog Day. They haven't progressed. Why? Because of the way they speak and what they accept in their lives. I rebuke any negativity, I rebuke you. Things like, you can't teach a dog new tricks. Forget that, rebuke that. If that was the case, Caleb would have fallen apart when he crossed over Canaan. He was as strong when he got to Canaan and, and even stronger than he left Egypt. Praise God. It's how what you embrace and what you internalize and what philosophies you accept in your mind. I can do all things for a Christ who strengthens me. If I want to start another degree now, I start another degree. If I want to run another marathon, I run another marathon. Obviously there are limitations to things, but you can do things more than you can imagine. And I'm convinced it's by the way people are speaking. Destroys them. Destroys them. Implode. They have a destruction button and they press it. When, when things fall apart around our lives, we've got to look to ourselves first. Because we're holding the smoking gun. We're holding the fuse. We're self-exploding and we think, who did it? But the way we get by this, we close our eyes and we press it without looking. And we, as long as we don't see ourselves doing it, we haven't done it. We are like an ostrich. We put our heads into the ground and we think, it's someone else, it's us. Change the way you're speaking. Don't blame other people for your, your procrastination. Yes, there are limitations. Source the people who can help you through that positively. Not the ones who keep saying, woe well, is you, and keeping you down. You need people to keep, keep you up. That's why the Psalm 33 6 says, by the word of the Lord. The word. If we have to even, the word, speak the word. 
start speaking, confessing the promise, the positive promises over your life will change everything. By the word of the Lord, the heavens were made. And all the hosts of them, by the breath of his word. Well, your divinity, speak things into creation. Speak blessings. And he'll come back and I will take you. I will bless those who bless you and I will curse him who curses you. Come on. Sign. Romans chapter 4 verse 17 says, And calls those things which do not exist as though they did. Speak into your situation. Speak positivity. If a if hundred people say no, just God saying yes cancels the hundred. If a billion people are saying no, one yes of God makes the difference. Oh, hallelujah. That's why Solomon tells us death and life when the power of the tongue. And those who love it will eat its fruit. Speak. Power in words. Power in words. So you have creative capacity. To bring things into creation. I'm not just talking about physical. I'm not saying, oh, microphone stand, the pier. I'm not talking about these things. I'm talking about spiritual progress. Removing spiritual obstacles. Because they're the ones that stop you obtaining these physical things. The physical things are the means. They're not the end. It's a spiritual, your spiritual empowerment that really matters. Please, I wish I'm speaking to you. If you're receiving this at home, just, there should be a number coming. Is there a number on the screen? Just say amen. Receive it. This is your, look. You may not need to tune in again. Just receive it and move on with the Lord. Praise God. Yeah. Hallelujah. I don't speak about material things over the pulpit. But I'm telling you, if you want to be blessed this material, you need to, you need to, uh, you need to spiritually be established. Yeah. Forget that. Because if you get, if you get, it's like getting a, a technolo something technological that you don't have the instructions. It looks nice, but you don't know how to use it. What's the good of that? It looks nice. I don't know how to use it. It's like those new, elaborate, sophisticated watches that you like work under the, under the sea and work in the air and tell you how fast you're falling out of an aeroplane and all this, but you don't have to use it. You just say, I've got one. Come on, this is what it's about. You need to come into this. Come on. You need to be committed to it. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. And this is the, the power of creativity. To create your blessings. Let God, the power of God. Because Christ in you is the power of God's presence in you. Praise the Lord. And that's what changes everything in your life. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. So as Paul tells us, I urge you to imitate me, he says. In 1 Corinthians 4, 16. I urge you to imitate me. I, 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 I pressurize you to imitate me. I admonish you to imitate Paul says. Because he knew the difference. Because when you have that divine connection, things change. He had it throughout his walk, praise the Lord, when he came to the Lord. And you can have it today, in your homes, in your living rooms, in this building, wherever you are, you can have the blessings of the Lord. Gives you confidence, gives you boldness, bold like a lion. Not, not arrogance. You've got to be careful being arrogant and conceited. Those things God doesn't like. You can need to tell the difference, different difference. But if you don't have the spirit, you won't know. You'll be proud, arrogant, and you think you're humble and... You're, you're, you're confident. But it doesn't work. The Holy Spirit makes sense of everything. So with these few words, God bless you. May you be rich. May you share in the nature of the Lord. Because that's what God's desire was from the very beginning. That you be partakers of divine nature. And I want to finish on these two few verses. 2 Peter chapter 1 verse 4 says this. Whereby are given unto us exceedingly great precious promises. That by these you may... Be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. Let that be your portion. God bless you. We love you. I'm going to hand back to the praise team. But before I hand back, let me just pray for everyone who's been watching and who's arrived here. Father, we pray for your blessing. Safeguard your people. Bless us. Protect us from all evil. Physical, spiritual, ailments, whatever it is, Lord, protect us. Pray, just commit each one of the people watching and here today to your throne, cover them, enrich them, that they truly will embrace and internalize their divine identity. We bless you, Lord. We thank you. We praise you. We give you the praise, the glory, and the worship that's only due to your name. And the church will say resounding. Amen. 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 Let's give the Lord the clap of you. God bless you. I invite the praise to you.
Amen. Just thank the Lord for that truly inspiring, powerful word this evening. And we're so blessed, aren't we? And we can come on a Friday, a Sunday, and we can hear messages like that that really give us that, that push to really excel in God and, and to become all that God wants us to truly be. Uh, I don't know about you, but I feel really, really blessed this evening. Really, really blessed. And I'm so thankful for what Christ has done for us. And where the, the Archbishop shared that message was truly from, from conviction, a, a real place of, 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 of conviction and from a place of, of experience. And we all need to come to that place individually and together as a body of Christ. So we just want to thank the Lord for his life this evening. We're going to lift up the final song we're going to declare the creed, um, which is a statement of belief that we um, believe. And the words of our Father everlasting, the all-creating one, God Almighty, through your Holy Spirit, conceiving Christ the Son, Jesus our Saviour. I believe in God our Father. I believe in Christ the Son. I believe in the Holy Spirit. Our God is three in one. I believe in the resurrection, that we will rise again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. And I believe in life eternal. I believe in the virgin birth. I believe in the saints' communion and in your holy church. I believe in the resurrection, when Jesus comes again. For I believe in the name of Jesus. Amen. Let's lift that up. Lord, for opening our eyes tonight and our hearts to see your glory through your word, Lord. 
Father, we thank you. You are faithful to us all these years, Lord, that we have never known a famine of your word. And we give you the glory and praise. And we ask you, Holy Spirit, to continue to lead and guide us to all truth. Expand and open our hearts and our minds. That we will not only be hearers of the word, but doers of the word, Lord. That we will reflect your glory in this world, Father. We thank you for our spiritual father, for our archbishop, Lord. May you bless him. May you refresh him, Lord. Lord, your word says to give double honor to those who labor in your word. And Father, we thank you for him and the gift that he is to the body of Christ. May you bless him. May you refresh him, Lord. And cover him with your precious blood, Lord. We give you glory, Lord. We thank you for our church, Lord. We thank you for our flock here and in their homes, that we are united in your spirit, Lord. We thank you for every member of this church, Lord. We thank you for the senior pastor who leads us in worship and, and gives us beautiful words, Lord, that we can look to and aspire to, Lord, that lifts our spirit, Lord. We thank you for every person here, Lord. May you bless them from the crown of their head to the soles of their feet. And grant us travel mercies, we pray, as we make our way home. Till we meet again in the fellowship of the saints. In Jesus' name. We share the grace. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with each one of us now and forevermore. And surely goodness and mercy shall follow us all the days of our lives, and we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever.